Chapter 13, Section 4, Biological Oxidation, Reduction Reactions, Redox Reactions. Previous sections, we've been focusing a lot on the phosphate groups, inorganic phosphate from ATP, and how that drives a lot of reactions, brings in the energy. But what we're going to see when we're discussing, um, say, like cellular respiration, it's not always the ATP that's the most important especially in glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, it's the redox reactions. Getting after those excited electrons. Because remember, those excited electrons have a lot of energy there. A lot of energy that we can utilize for making things occur. Thing is, those, those excited electrons aren't just going to go wherever you need them to. You need some form of a carrier. A carrier that's going to accept an excited electron and then transport it, chaperone it from one place in the cell to somewhere else where it can be used and release the electron without losing any of the energy. The electromotive force, the EMF, this is Think of this as how much, you know, work can be done, how much um, affinity, to what degree are these electrons excited, especially when you're comparing two chemical species, compound A, compound B, compound A has an excited electrons, compound B doesn't, you know, can we move those from one place to the other? A's got high energy electrons, B's just got electrons. What does that mean? What can now we now do with A and B where A's got some energy because of you know, what orbitals that electrons happen to be in? When we look at the oxidative reduction reactions, these redox reactions, a lot of times we'll go through and we'll just look at the half reactions. Overall, iron plus copper gives us, you know, Fe2 plus copper 2 plus gives us Fe3 plus plus copper 3 plus. Okay, so what's going on? Well, look at the reactions. We're going from Fe2 to Fe3, and we're giving it up an electron because now it's going from 2 to 3 plus. So now it's light, another electron, heavy, another proton. Cu2 plus an electron. Now it's only light one as opposed to two electrons. Who's giving up? Who's accepting? Who's donating? Who's accepting the electrons? Who's donating? Who's accepting? Reducing agent means it's giving up. Oxidizing agent means it's accepting. But the reducing agent gets oxidized. The oxidizing agent gets reduced. Because remember, to take the electron means you've been reduced. To give it up means you've been oxidized. That's why I hate these terms. You don't rarely hear me use these terms. I mostly stick with who's got reduced, who, got, who was oxidized. But any way you look at it, you have to have redox pairs, okay? Who's giving up the electron? Where's it going? Who's taking the electron ultimately? The oxidation, the giving up of the electron, often happens to have some form of dehydrogenation going on means a hydrogen being removed, which makes sense. After all, hydrogen is nothing more than an electron 
that has a proton somewhere around it. Now, I know up in, chem in chemistry world, you deal with electrons on their own in your reactions or at least in your equations. One of the things that the biologists, we don't quite comprehend that. So you'll see us discuss these redox reactions or things being moved around and we'll talk about it in the terms of the hydrogen. Who's got the hydrogen? Where's the hydrogen going? In the back of our minds, you know, equating that hydrogen that's being moved around as an electron, an excited electron. Doesn't always make sense. So this dehydrogenation, removing the hydrogen, releasing an excited electron. So you'll see the electrons, that excited electron that's being taken from A, A who's just been oxidized and then transferred somewhere else well a lot of times that electron will just be an electron boom okay like i said or it's going to be a hydrogen or a hydride ion that's being carried along again an electron just with a proton somewhere around it that's all we're talking here You'll see sometimes reactions we refer to what is called a reducing equivalent. Okay, it's a redox reaction. That is discussing, it's looking at just a single electron. Okay, set of, you know, multiple electrons, dual electrons, electron pairs, things like that. It's one and done. As it all thinks, there has to be some constant or something we can measure so we can sit there and compare apples to apples. They refer to one of these things here for the redox reactions and measurement of electrons as the standard reduction potential, E naught. A measure in volts of the relative affinity of the electron acceptor of each redox pair for the electrons. So you set up in two containers with a salt bridge of a potassium chloride solution. So this is a tube full of potassium chloride connecting these two beakers of, of solution. Hydrogen gas pumped into this one. So it's highly hydrogenated gas, lots of hydrogen there. Over here, something to be tested, something to be examined. And then you go and you look. Are the electrons moving from one to the other via the salt bridge? If it's positive, then that means that this so whatever is in this solution here is taking the electrons. If it's negative, that means the electron flow is coming this way. So this is being readily oxidized. If they're flowing the other way, and this is positive, that means not only the electrons moving this way, but whatever this is, is readily reduced. That half reaction, hydrogen plus an electron equals one half H2. When you're not sure which direction you look at, you know, who has the more positive E naught. This tells you who's being reduced, where the electrons are gonna go, who's going to be getting it. The reduction potential is based on that E naught. The reduction potential E equals E naught plus RT divided by NF, okay? Plus concentration of the acceptor divided by the concentration of the donor. 
F here is the Faraday constant. So what this does, it gives us a means again of ranking across the spectrum. Who has the greater potential for being reduced? Previous slides, we looked at, can the thing be reduced? Is it more, is it because of its chemical composition gonna be more leaning towards being something to be reduced, something to be oxidized? More of an oxidizing agent, more of a reducing agent. The Nernst equation here allows us to sit there and kind of compare, kind of like the delta G does. You know, the delta G prime naught when we're comparing ATP to ADP and things like that. This is going to allow us to see who's going to be the greater reducing agent, who's going to be less of a reducing agent. That whole RT divided by, uh, what is it, NF, gets to be a bit much. So what some chemists have done is they've shown that there is a workaround, making things a little bit easier. Is it going to be foolproof? Is it going to give you a specific, you know, answer that is, you know, scientifically accurate? No, but it's going to give you an approximation. So you take this simplified Nernst equation that you're just going to sit there and always assume it's going to be run at approximately a room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. E equals E naught plus 0 0.26 V divided by N and then our ratio of acceptor to donor. And then when you go and you start looking at, again, these redox reactions based on the reducing potentials, and you start going and looking at these numbers, you know, the reducing the E naught of iron to ferric iron to ferrous iron, 0.771. Reducing reaction of oxygen plus hydrogen gas to yield hydrogen peroxide, 0.295. You go down here, NAD plus hydrogen plus two excited electrons to give NADH negative 0 0.320. Two hydrogens plus two electrons yielding H2 gas, negative 0 The electrons tend to flow where the more positive E, okay? The more positive, remember those last ones I talked about, you know, the two hydrogens plus two electrons yielding H2 gas. Okay, that was extremely negative. That means it wants to go the opposite direction, H2 to two separate hydrogens, two electrons on their own. Whereas the first one, ferric to ferrous iron, okay, with a positive zero point blah, blah, blah. Higher the number, the more positive the number, the greater the chance that's the direction the electrons will flow. When you look at these electrons that are going to be captured, going to be harvested throughout cellular respiration, they need to be moved around. I'm going to use what are referred to as electron carriers. And what's interesting, these electron carriers, they are, you know, evolutionarily 
they have been conserved. You're going to find, if not these exact, versions of these throughout all living cells. NAD, NADP, FMN, FAD, whatever. FMN, FAD are usually going to be enzyme bound. NAD, NADP, freely diffusible. They're, you know, soluble. They are moving through the cytoplasm. They are moving through the aqueous solution contained within any organelle. These guys, the NADs, are going to be part of what they refer to as a pyridine nucleotide. Okay. What that means is that it's a nicotinamide ring that kind of resembles the pyr pyridine nucleotides, the nitrogenous rings of nucleotides. Nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide, NAD or NAD plus, when it gets oxidized. Nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, also known as NADP. P means it has a phosphate group. You find this pretty much only in plants. NAD, everybody else. And you look at it. Okay, there's your adenosine. That looks exactly like an RNA nucleotide. Have the phosphate group, boom. And the phosphate group and then another quasi-nucleotide. But this one has been abridged. This is NAD oxidized, means that it does not, it has a overall positive charge. The electron that's going to be captured, stripped off of something, needs to be transported, moved around, reserved, set, reserved and then taken somewhere else for some other metabolic activity while it's still in an excited state. There it is. This single hydrogen now becomes two hydrogens. Two hydrogens in this orientation or that orientation doesn't matter. This is NADH, the reduced form of NAD+. Notice I'm sitting here talking electrons and a hydrogen's been added. Okay, remember, hydrogens for a biological standpoint is nothing more than an electron carrying along a proton. NADP and NADPH both can bring along two electrons. They bring two electrons to the party. Now they can accept the electrons, hydride ion, or donate the hydride ion. They can bring it in or they can release it. So this biologically discussing like um, the next few chapters when we're talking you know, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, not so much at play, but there are many other reactions occurring beyond just cellular respiration where excited electrons need to be taken, moved around the cell. <laughs> And that NAD is going to come into play there. And it's going to get its excited electrons from hydride ions. The oxidoreductases you'll see in primary literature. These are a form of dehydrogenases, but their job is to be part of this oxidation reduction of NAD. Okay, oxidoreductases, you're going to see um, most of them that I know of and think of off the top of my head, can't think of their names right now, are going to be mitochondrial bound and they're going to be part of that oxidative or phosphorylation, the third steps or the third phase of cellular respiration. 
NAD, it's everywhere, okay? All cells, eukaryotic, prokaryotic, we'll use it. And it's not just for the capturing of those excited electrons and chaperoning them around. They're also, the NAD is gonna be utilized throughout other metabolic functions. I mean, it's part of activation of DNA ligases um, for bacteria. Um, it's interaction with uh, the cholera toxin. Activates cholera toxin after it's been taken up in our cells. And there's many other things where it's involved in regulating inflammation, apoptosis, they think it has to do with aging, how our cells tell time, things like that. We see that there we have evolved, we being humans, mammals, have evolved to get our NAD and many other um, biologically active compounds that we need from many of the vitamins and things that we take up. Um, niacin is one of the vitamins we have to take, which is actually one of the building blocks. It's the base structure that we use for the formation of NAD. You have a diet that's lacking in niacin, you can end up with what is referred to as pellagra, pellagra, depending upon what part of the Western world you're in and kind of a accent you have, pellagra. Dermatitis, as you see here, diarrhea, dementia. It's because you have lack niacin in your diet means you are running out of NAD and it prevents cellular respiration it prevents, you know, other metabolic functions, you know, that we just talked about on the last slide. Now, when you look at niacin, niacin here is this ring, has a carboxyl group attached to it. Nicotine amide, which remember, going to be part of that second pseudo um, a nucleotide that we saw in NAD. It's niacin, but instead of carboxyl, you have a carbonyl with an amine group added to it. Tryptophan, one of our amino acids, can also be built upon this. Tryptophan can also go backwards to nicotine amide. But it's all right here, niacin, boom, niacin, boom. For whatever reason, um, they started looking at nicotine ye, many, many, many decades ago. Hey, look, it's got the same ring. And, you know, yes, instead of a carboxyl, it has this other secondary ring. But, yeah, there's no way that they can take nicotine to niacin, nicotine to nicotine amide, nicotine to tryptophan. Um, just doesn't seem to work. We have quite a few proteins and things like that that we take up in our diets, flavor proteins. Um, these are going to be, or that we have in us, and that are going to use proteins and things in our diet, vitamins, that are going to catalyze the formation of the FMN or the FAD. Remember those membrane-bound versions of that, you know, aid in the capture and the transfer of those excited electrons. So you'll hear people have to have a diet rich in riboflavins and things like that. These are the base molecules, just like we talked about on the last one with niacin. These riboflavins are going to be the base molecules for the formation of the flavin proteins, which will then be used to, you know, FAD formation. When you look here, this is kind of interesting. FAD, remember FAD, going to do some of the same similar, similar thing that we saw with NAD. We have a nucleotide. We have this long chain and then this triple cyclic ring thing. Again, nitrogen here accepts hydrogen there. And this nitrogen there, except a second. So you'll see in 
textbooks you'll see in the primary literature that when FMN gets reduced, it becomes FMNH2, one, two.